Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Whitwam Organic Report. My name is David Whitwam, and I am your host. Thank you so much for joining me today. So today is our Every Other Week interview, and I have um, a wonderful guest with me today who was absolutely instrumental in getting uh, a, a school garden project up and going and implemented here in the Tampa Bay area. And today we're going to kind of talk about um, the ins and the outs, uh, the do's and the don'ts, what worked and what didn't. Um, so if you are watching and you have thought about a school garden, if you're um, a parent at a school with a garden revamped or doesn't have a garden at all, today would be a great episode for you to watch. If you're a teacher at a school, uh, you're going to probably glean a lot of really important information from this as well because you need those parents on your team. And I have a parent with me today who was absolutely fabulous at uh, rocking and rolling on the school garden. But before we get into that, let's get into our weekly garden and nursery report. So um, the strawberries uh, that we planted a few weeks ago, uh, they're all up and going. Right now, we're kind of starting to see which ones are going to make it and which ones aren't. Typically, out in beds, I lose about 10% of them. Uh, in the nursery, we lose up to 30%. Uh, different types of soil um, that we're still experimenting with. Um, we're starting them in smaller containers. The main thing with those strawberries is you just got to keep them watered until they can set uh, new roots. And there's this fine balance between, you know, keeping them too wet and, and then getting fungus problems and not getting them enough water and having those uh, bare root strawberry plants dry out. So it's always a real challenge, but uh, always really exciting and we're always learning. We also uh, are really rocking and rolling on our uh, thicker, uh, thicker leaved uh, leafy greens, you know, the winter greens that I consider to be more heat tolerant, collards, kale, broccoli, cabbage, uh, uh, what else, uh, bok, I do not all bok choy. Um, most bok choy likes it cooler. We do have a red bok choy that is very heat tolerant, and we've got that one going uh, as well. Um, those, all those starts are just now going out into our garden. So this morning, I actually put some of those uh, winter greens out into our gardens uh, for the first time. I was planning on putting them out a few weeks ago, but the heat has just kind of lingered on. It's been, um, I, I mean, if you've been watching these videos, you can see I'm, I'm not a weather guy. Why? I try to be a weather guy, being a gardener, but, but um, I really should keep my day job and focus on gardening. Um, but I've been predicting the weather to cool off in a week for the past five weeks. Um, but that's, I was looking at wind directions. I was looking at um, uh, different predictions, highs and lows, uh, uh, fronts coming down. But these darn Storms out in the, that's what's messing me up. They just uh, kind of swoop through and, and blast everything out. Uh, keep those cold fronts from coming down, redirect the wind uh, from the south as they, as they pass by. So it's really hot and humid right now in Tampa. Thank goodness the morning temperatures are still down around in the lower 70s. Um, so although this stuff looks a little stressed out, uh, a lot of our winter vegetables that we had planted early are doing fine and they're going to be okay because there there is cold weather coming i promise it comes every year i uh, just don't know when but we're predicting and they're predicting right around halloween um uh, november 1st it should cool off and that stuff is going to be really happy the fall fruits and vegetables that we put in melons tomatoes cucumbers eggplant squash are all doing wonderful they love this weather it's not too hot and it's not too cold yet still plenty of sunshine um, we, I think when, when I came home today, uh, with a bag, my wife was like, please no more zucchini. So we have zucchini coming out of our ears. Um, and, uh, that's kind of where you should be with that stuff. I, it's, it's borderline. If you're in central Florida and you have not planted tomatoes, peppers, or eggplant, squash, melons yet, um, you can roll the dice and try them by seed. I would recommend getting starts at this, this late in the game. Uh, uh, as far as starting stuff by seed goes, again, uh, it's those more heat tolerant winter greens that we're really focusing on planting out by seed right now. Uh, and 
tending to the tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, squash, melons that we already have growing. Uh, we've already started planting our, our root crops. A lot of them are up, carrots are in. Uh, we've done some turnips, radishes. So this is an exciting time of year, stuff planted. If you're new to this, I recommend maybe doing a mix up of some stuff by seedlings and some stuff by seeds. I think it's a good idea to get in there and do some things that are new to you, maybe that you're not as comfortable with. I talk to a lot of clients, customers, friends, family, and fellow gardeners who are new to starting seeds. They say they fail at seeds all the time. And excuse me just one second, y'all. They are really hesitant to try seeds, but it's get out there, buy seeds. They're relatively inexpensive. Um, it's a good thing to fail at. Uh, just keep trying, trying new stuff, do more research, try and figure out what happened, what you did wrong, and and keep at it. Because really, if you can get down pat starting stuff by seed, that's going to open up your world to the most varieties that are out there. Uh, it's going to help you to get things started on time, maybe not necessarily when your local store has the stuff on the shelf you can get it started when you want to get it started so i really encourage if you're if you're newer to this uh or new to this you're not comfortable with seeds and you're putting your first garden in right now mix it up do do a little bit of both do you know if you even if you want to do mostly plants do some seeds like practice what i'm getting at you'll save money uh you'll save time in the long run so definitely something to get down pat uh, white flies are virtually gone. Aphids are definitely showing up on some of our more cool weather crops with this with this heat. Um, most of the summer stuff that we had in for a late summer planting, that's all gone by now. What I'm talking about is um, Malabar spinach, uh, uh, Egyptian Egyptian spinach, okra. Uh, sweet potatoes, sweet potatoes. Now, if you still have sweet potatoes in, usually this time of year, I see one or two problems really happen with people who are, are a little late in the game and, and getting their sweet potatoes going late. One of them is the sweet potato white fly. Those are really bad right now. And the other one, I don't even know what it is. I think it's like a weevil or something or a beetle. I don't know. It's in the soil and it makes your sweet potatoes look like Swiss cheese. So I usually try and get my sweet potatoes out before the first of November. Um, again, if you were late putting them in, I know people who leave their sweet potatoes in year round, um, and they just kind of have a place that they grow their sweet potatoes. I'm talking more from the direction of somebody who's limited on space and is going to be pulling out the sweet potatoes and starting fall crops. That's what I mean. Like if you got your sweet potatoes in late, they take a while. Um, might want to just go ahead and get them up and out, uh, and out of the way. Because uh, again, right now they will just have problems, with diseases, and I know that they're probably too small. Uh, but it's time to move on, learn your lesson. Next summer, get them started a little bit earlier. Again, I know people might watch this and they're naysayers. Oh, I don't know. Get around. That's fine. I'm talking about people who need that space or something else to get their fall garden going. Um, let's see, what else do we have going on? Um, I mean, other than the white flies, all of our peppers are starting to recover from that. Um, it, it 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 was it was a bad year. It was a bad year for people with peppers all over all over the Bay Area. I've talked to many many gardeners uh, that had them, and again, um, if you're new to this and you have peppers in for late summer, early fall, um, and you got those white flies, just get in there, keep the plants monitored, look on the underside of the leaves. There's white stuff underneath. Those are the larvae. So pick those leaves off, drop them in a little thing of soap, and dispose of them properly. Get them out. They will move on, especially once that weather uh, really cools off. Um, so, yeah, today we planted uh, plugs in a garden of broccoli. I, I'm sorry, collard greens. I did Swiss chard, and uh, I'm going to butcher this, comatosuma which is basically like a, a, a tatsoi or loose leaf bok choy. Um, our, uh, like I said, our, our 
zucchinis are still like really busting out and, and producing. The plants are looking rough though, by the way. So our zucchini plants that are producing really heavy right now, they're looking really rough. I actually just had a conversation with somebody yesterday on, um, you know, right now I'm trying to kind of decide if I'm going to treat the problems that they're having. A little bit of, little bit of powdery mildew, a little bit of downy mildew. We're cutting off the damaged uh, and bad leaves of the plants. I am feeding them extra food. My experience is, is even if things are really perfect and I do nip whatever's going on with them in the bud, these plants only produce for maybe four weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks. So I, I don't usually feel like I buy that much more time uh, if, if, if I treat and, and take care of the problem. They still just kind of peter out. What I found if I want a longer harvest of zucchini is I plant another round somewhere else. So I plant them in succession. I do two plantings of them. Uh, I'm not doing it this year. Like I said, those around me, we're getting kind of sick of them. We're ready to move on. I was actually just talking about what are we going to put in the zucchini bed. I think we're going to plant more kale. Um, that's always a big a big hit with uh, with the community members. Um, as far as seeds go, uh, oh, herbs. Uh, we've been planting the heck out of parsley, cilantro. Uh, oh, and by the way, let's just talk about cilantro for a second. So cilantro, I get asked about a lot. Uh, people who love their herbs and love their herb garden, a lot of people always say, I can't grow cilantro to save my life. Well, guess what? I can't either. Neither can anybody else. Cilantro is 100% a true angle, meaning it grows, goes to seed, and then dies. You can't trim it. and I mean, you can keep it a little bit longer by keeping it trimmed. It's just kind of the nature of the plant. If you want a continuous harvest of cilantro, unlike a thyme or a parsley where you, you just cut some leaves off and it just sprouts back out, really need to plant more. The other thing is, it is not that great at being transplanted. And a lot of the nurseries, they get a pot and they throw 20 cilantro seeds in one little pot. And so when you buy it, it's actually like 20 plants. So definitely not following proper plant spacing at that point. And um, I think they do it because it helps it sell better, helps it sell sooner. They do that with a lot of vegetables too. Um, you know, maybe like 10 cucumber seeds. So there's a bunch of plants coming out. It looks better on the shelf and uh, helps, makes you buy it. Um, but really not the best thing to do uh, as, as far as, you know, transplant. Here in our nursery, we might put one or two plants in a little two by three that's really proper. Um, but the best thing for you to do is to figure out seeds with cilantro. Biggest mistake people make because they're big old honking seeds. Um, biggest mistake people make is they plant it too deep. Cilantro seeds are covered with like a tenth of an inch of soil, meaning like you could just throw them on the ground really hard and yell at them and they're going to be deep enough. So you want to plant it super shallow. Plant super shallow, wait for this cooler weather. Yes, we have cooler weather right now compared to August, September, July. This is definitely cooler weather. Um, I'm not sweating through my clothes right now. And it's you can definitely get that cilantro going right now. I think the germination, high germination temperature on cilantro is like 76 degrees. We should be hitting that during the night um, right now. So uh, figure out if, you, if you're big into eating cilantro, um, then figure out how to grow by seed. It's really the best thing for you to do. Quit buying those plants that have 20 plants, 20 seeds thrown in one little pot. That's never going to make it. You might get one or two little cilantro harvests out of it. It's going to die. Um, other herbs that we're planting, thyme, like I said, parsley, oregano, uh, sage. Uh, I mean, this is just, this is a great season to plant uh, all, all of your herbs. We're taking cuttings right now and transplanting of our African blue basil. Um, just going nuts with the herbs, uh, with the herbs right now. So definitely time to get your herbs going, uh, as well as your fruits and vegetables. But our big focus over the next couple of weeks are going to be the winter crops. Uh, I think at another garden I'm at tomorrow, I'm actually going to be clearing out a bed that has summer stuff in it, adding soil, turning it, adding fertilizer, and getting it prepped for winter stuff because 
our winter is around the corner, cooler weather. Uh, cooler weather to me means basically that you're not sweating your clothes. So that's it for our garden report and our nursery report. And uh, we'll talk more about that next week. Hopefully when we're meeting up next week, it will be a lot cooler. We can talk about what to do with this. With this. So now I had the pleasure a few years back of um, working with one of our local elementary schools with an, an amazing garden project. It's just, they were, they were just an amazing school to work with. I, I wish I had taken more pictures of kids and the smiles and the parents and, and the teachers. It was just a really, really incredible project. And I tell you right now, as I'm sitting here, because I do work with other schools where I do not have a, a central person that I'm, that I'm working with and they are just an uphill battle the whole time. So, um, I, I really like to introduce you guys to Kristen, who I work with. She was a parent at Murray Elementary. Hey there, Kristen. Hey, David. Thanks for having me. How so, you doing? I'm good, thanks. You see me? Oh, Hear me? man. My sound got all messed up. Hang on just one second. Oh, boy. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yay! <laughs> okay, that that didn't work. Um, I got a phone call while I was on this, and I think it stole the information from my headset and didn't jump back over. Ah. Uh, so let's get back into what the real stuff is that we're going to talk about. So, um, Kristen, why don't you tell everybody about kind of what you were doing at Glory? Um, how you came across the, um, you know, the garden and the interest in it. And yeah, just kind of fill everybody in on, on how that went down. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think it was like the spring of 2018, this kind of crossed my path. Um, it had been, and then at this point I learned it had actually been a, a proposed in years prior. Someone had worked with you, I think in 2015, proposed it. Unfortunately, it didn't pass. And I'll, I'll cover that a little bit later. But in 2018, this passed my plate. And it was um, one of those things at the time I was on the PTA. And two of my roles, one of my roles was communications. So it was doing internal communications and also external communications for the school. Um, and my other big role was um, doing the annual walkathon, which is our biggest fundraiser for the PTA. Um, and I also had this huge passion for gardening. I grew up in a family of huge gardeners. We grew up in Virginia and we just had, my parents were always coming up with this great produce. I could never um, mirror that. I, I failed at everything I ever put in the ground, but um, I loved the concept of it. I loved, I remember growing out as a kid and seeing all the, the herbs, the produce and um, being so impressed by it. So when this idea came past me, I, just thought I, I kind of fell in love with the concept and um, I called David immediately. We started talking through this. David and I had worked previously at a garden for Center for Girls up in Seminole Heights and that was so much fun and it meant so much to my kids and so much to me and seeing these kids smile and dig, get their hands in dirt and um, it was just fabulous. So um, I actually put together a proposal with David we got the costs, we got the um, the design, everything put in, and David was a, a huge help here. Um, and then they started kind of working internally, trying to figure out how, how to sell this internally. How, how can I sell this to parents? How can I sell this to administration, to faculty? Because it um, it costs money. And in any school, there's a lot of, a, a lot of, everyone's pushing for, for, for money somewhere, whether it's books, the library, garden. Um, so I put together a plan and I got together, I got a group together of kind of 
kind of like-minded uh, like-minded parents and and teachers who really fell behind this they, they knew there was something uh to be gained from this um just the education whether you're, you're learning math science um some reading art there, there is so much to be gained from an on-school garden so um push this internally through um beginning with presentations to the pta and to the foundation which would ultimately fund this um that was um it was actually relatively easy and i also had a, a slight win there because i knew i knew our school had the funds to support this at that time it wasn't a, a monumental effort but i i it kind of had the 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 shoe in that that we we could afford it and um that was that was a, a blessing for me so um it passed it actually passed really really strongly i don't think anyone opposed it um on either side and teachers parents everyone alike everyone was really excited about it and the next big step was making this happen um so like david you and i always talk when you have a school garden you've got your pre-communications, you've got your during communications, you've got your post communications, it never stops because you have to keep everyone um, everyone motivated and moving forward. So well, we- Kristen, yeah. what, what um, it sounds like there's a lot of moving parts there. Like what, what were the moving parts that you had to communicate between, like what, if, if you weren't doing what you were doing, who needed to be communicating that maybe wouldn't have been communicating had there been a liaison between them? Like, what are all these moving parts? So it, it really, I, I think with any school, what you're going to have to deal with is you're going to have to, if a parent comes up with an idea, you're going to have to preach it to the school and you've got to get the school on board. You've got to get the, 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 the parents on board and you have to have the teachers. This never would have worked if we didn't have the teachers on board because the parents, yeah, absolutely. Can us, we can show up as volunteers and we can show up ready to dig. But if we don't have teachers on board, it's not going to be a success. So we, we saw a little bit of that. Um, you know, we ended up with um, a full 18 raised beds at, at Gory, and it was a fantastic garden. Um, and we saw, I think, probably what a lot of schools see. You see some teachers who are all in, and then you see some teachers who are maybe 20% in. So uh, you're always going to have to try to work that balance. That's why I feel like the steering committee and have like the parent steering committee and a teacher committee is an absolute must no matter what to keep to kind of the glue of the garden together if that makes sense it does it does make sense um so this was a little not totally unique but this was a little bit of a unique uh situation a lot of gardens that i'm presented with it's kind of a teacher's idea and i'm i'm trying to tell the teacher that almost almost the opposite of what you're saying they need to go get some parents on board or this will never work and so it's just interesting to see it from your point of view coming in as a parent who's kind of putting the whole thing together saying oh without the teachers this wouldn't work and i think what i'm seeing from hearing the same conversation from two different sides is without parents and teachers <laughs> it's not going to work i mean you really you really need both that's um, absolutely correct because even when it came time to we had some fabulous projects we had projects remember when we had like the big dig we put all the soil in the gardens and the kids are putting the fertilizer in and the kids are putting seedlings in like none of that could have happened without the teachers and their help with scheduling the scheduling was a really big one because the teachers couldn't have done that um because teachers know their testing schedules they know what's going on in the school so that was that was absolutely critical we couldn't have done it without them and I think that's important that you pointed that out because um, if not you, then who would have been, I mean, the teachers did a lot working around their schedules, but that whole process still needed to happen. And I'm just wondering, had there not been a parent at the school, a teacher, one of these other teachers who's really, really busy, I guess what I'm trying to get at is I've seen a lot of teachers do this and get burned out mm -hmm. because not only are they one of those teachers who needs to work around their schedule to get their kids out into the garden. Okay. But now they're also trying to coordinate with all the other teachers and their schedules. Mm -hmm. So having the position that you, I, I get, from what I've seen from all the school gardens I've been a part of, 
the position that you filled, the reason why other school gardens it doesn't get filled is because I don't think people understand that the position exists, mm -hmm. that it's needed. Yeah. That all the things that, that you did still need to get done. And it just basically falls on the shoulders of whatever teacher is the most exciting, excited about the garden. That's right. And I think one thing we tried to do, because we knew that this was a, it, I don't want to say burden, because I think the teachers were very excited about this, especially, I, I'd say probably three or four teachers, especially. Um, we, as, as parents, the steering committee, we tried to do everything. We got, we put the ideas out there. We organized it as best as possible and tried to give the teachers um, kind of an easy path to make it happen because we knew we couldn't make it happen. We needed them. They needed us. So it was very much, very much a team. Right. And also um, I think, I think the marketing too was big. I mean, whether it's the school newsletters, the school websites, and the, the photos that we got, the photos of the kids in the garden and these beautiful green leaves and beautiful like peaches, those photos did did phenomenally well on social media. And the kids, it just, uh, and the parents loved it. The parents loved seeing their kids out there, they're, they're, they're working. And I, it was it was really nice to see um, so many parents raise their hand and say, hey, well, I want to get involved. So we were very lucky in that way that we had a lot of parent involvement. So you, you've mentioned two terms uh, today that stood out. Um, earlier you were talking about selling it, and now you just talked about marketing. Yep. And when I'm talking to a school or even a community or an organization about gardening, um, I'm always trying to explain to them that to get these up and off the ground, to get the momentum that they need, and to keep that momentum, it's not about gardening and it's not about gardening correctly or knowing how to garden. How much did you know about gardening when we started at Glory? Nothing. Other than being exposed to the farm and eating it. No, nothing. Um, I, I knew nothing. Um, I, I loved the concept of it, but again, I couldn't grow anything if I tried. And um, it doesn't take that, but that, that's kind of my point, what you're saying here is that the person who champions it, the, the parent that champions it does not need to be a gardener, nor does the teacher. You just have, a, have to have a want to want to see it come to life and you have to um, have some time and some energy and, and maybe maybe some other other skills versus gardening, maybe some people skills, or, some organizational, skills. organizational, organizational skills, yeah. organizational yeah. skills, financial skills. There's a lot of, you know, there was budgeting that took place too, but it's not, school doesn't need a green thumb to make this happen at, at all. In fact, the people that were, that made this happen at Gory, they, they weren't green thumbs. At all, they were just people who wanted to, to see this happen. They believed in it, and they loved the idea of it. I mean, I I um I think that's just really that's really important to point out. Um, I've gone to many schools uh, that are talking about having a garden, and um, you know, having that first meeting at a round table, sitting in the in the library, and I'm sitting there with the teacher who called me, the principal. And then maybe like one or a parent and maybe another teacher. And the principal or the teacher is like, well, this is, these are the only people we could get right now who know anything about gardening. And I'm like, no. Yeah. <laughs> no I, I agree. Early that's, in the stage, that's wonderful. But like, that's not the skill set we need at this point in the game. Yep. I, I completely agree. Um, that won't. That's not going to. That's not going to be a win. It's nice to have someone who knows what they're doing to lean on to say, "Hey, listen, what do I do here? What do I do here?" But that's kind of why we had you on board. Was um, you were you were our person who came on site once a week and, and walked us through that. But we needed the person to to kind of keep this going, um, whether it's sell or marketing or um, just keep moving it forward because it's um, it's not something that you start and walk away from. You have to got you got to stick with it. That's the other thing. You, what you just pointed out. Um, no one's ever come directly out and said this, but I do get the impression from some parents and some teachers, administer, administrators, when we're talking about the garden, they almost view it as, um, you know, the, the Bunsen burners in chemistry class that when you're not using them, you can just put them away in the cabinet and then take them down when it's time for chemistry class. And the garden's not like that because it's a living thing and so that we can, so the teachers do have a garden to use when they need it. What what was it that we came up with at Gory uh, that we did on, on a regular basis? 
Like I saw, I saw you guys and other parents more often than I saw the teachers and the kids. Yep. Cause we met every Monday, every Monday we met and we, we kept everything clean. We kept it looking nice and uh, we kept it healthy. Um, the kids, we would have these projects with kids, maybe once every, once a month, once every two months, we'd have a classroom out there. Or we do an after school project, something really cool. Um, but you're right. It was, it was the steering committee and, and that, that the teacher that we had was actually mostly the steering committee, um, who, who dug in and, and, and made it work. And that's, um, I think kind of a unique way to approach, uh, the, the school garden in that, um, we did have, we did, we did kind of, we did two approaches at the same time in that we had certain beds assigned to certain teachers, mm -hmm. right? But there wasn't all the beds because then we had other beds that were just as the, as the gardening committee, you guys were just kind of in charge of keeping them planted and, and upkeeping them. Yeah. So, those are the beds. Yep. So, so we had kind of both things going on at once so that uh, teachers who maybe didn't have a bed could still come out and do classes or lessons in the garden uh, without A, feeling like um, they're messing with another teacher's bed who it's assigned to, or B, um, taking on the full responsibility themselves of having to take care of the garden all the time. Yep. I think, I think that's right. And I think one thing we also learned through all of us, Dave, was that we, we learned a lot from day one. We learned that maybe assigning beds isn't necessarily right, or maybe having some open beds is right. And I feel like you're going to morph as you, as you go on through this whole gardening exercise in, in, in the garden, you're going to, you're going to change and you're going to figure out what's right for the school. And um, we did a lot of that. And I, I feel like um, we needed to do that to, to make it work. And, you know, you got to keep playing around with it, figure out what works for the school. A lot of a lot of bobbing and weaving. Yep, a lot of bobbing. Yeah. So yeah, you kind of pick a method and you go with it so that you have something to change <laughs> later right. on. And, and yeah, we definitely, yeah, definitely, and I, I've I've seen that with the different schools and the different gardens that I've been a part of. They're all, you know, I I start them all kind of out the same, but they definitely grow and and morph into their own their own thing. Um. And I think that's really important. Uh, Yvonne said something uh, just a second ago that I want to bring up because the, um, can you still hear me? I just had, okay, yeah. good. So Yvonne said that enthusiasm and determination are much more important than the color of anyone's thumb. And we had mentioned earlier that uh, one of the skill sets that's needed is, you know, good organizational skills. Listen, if you're a parent and you're interested in um, in doing this at your school and organization is not your forte, but you can get in there and get people riled up and you have determination and you're very excited about this and you're very steadfast, then you know when you're looking for a parent or a teacher to partner with what their skill set needs to be. Because what I found is people are very neat and interesting. And some people who have really, really good organizational skills maybe aren't the most enthusiastic or uh, people oriented. So maybe you put together a small team from the get go. I know you said at Gore, you put together an entire steering committee, right? But and, I guess what I'm saying to people and, and inviting them to do is from the offset, if you need a co-leader, these are, these are, we're not saying that these are all of the skill sets that you need to do a school garden. We're saying these are all the skill sets that are needed. <laughs> I guess is what I'm trying to, I just wanted to really point that out. Um, so, is there anything that you think, if you had to do it all over again, is there anything that you would have done differently? I don't think so. I mean, it was a great ride. I, I still like kind of wish I could go back to 2018 and do it again because it was so fun. There was so much energy. Remember in the beginning when we did the the dirt day, um, it was so much fun and seeing all the kids' faces. Um, 
One thing I will say that, that we did is we started small. So we decided to do kind of a phased approach. We started with um, kind of the basic garden of gardens. You know, you're, you're building your beds. It was 18 beds, which is, which is you know, a really nice size garden. Um, so we started with that versus kind of starting with like the uber beautiful garden that has absolutely everything. And then we built as we grew. So then the next year we added a seedling table, a blueberry patch, some trees. Um, because it was so successful, we could warrant that. And because there was interest in it. Um, so I, I feel like that's really important too, versus don't, do, you don't need to dive in and, and try to do everything at once. Like take baby steps. Baby steps are really good. They're good for the budget. They're good for learning. And, and it keeps like, there's always a like a new, new something every year to learn. So I thought that was a win for us too. So talking about starting small, um, I never even brought this up just because of the kind of when I was brought in by you the sec for the second time, there was already, I felt enough momentum that I didn't even need to bring this up. But sometimes when it's a parent of one class or a teacher and they're talking about having a school garden one day, um, I, I always like to tell them that, you know, there is a really, really, really pared down version of a school garden where it's really just a gardening related classroom project. And I, I guess we never ran into this. Uh, well, maybe now with COVID, <laughs> um, but we never ran into this at Gory. One of the things I've seen halting that uh, progression of starting small and, and kind of leading up is I guess not, not admitting to yourselves what you're actually capable of doing, uh, how much can you, you know, bite off and chew, and not having a exit strategy. Meaning, if this doesn't work, when are we going to call it quits for now? How are we going to cover it up? Are we going to, you know, how are we going to clean the whole area so we can sit? all summer or all of like what if there's downtime and you can't really stick with it which happens how can you get it so that when you make another run at it it hasn't been just sitting there being a big weeded mess for everybody to see because then that makes it even harder you know mm -hmm. it's not just that it petered out it's that it's also been an eyesore for x number of months so what I tell a lot of teachers or parents of like a, a really involved parent in a classroom, not a parent involved in the school, but wants to see a garden, a, a school garden, I tell them, you know, hey, start really, really small. Maybe just a garden for your classroom. Mm -hmm. And you can do that with like earth boxes or containers. Something that... If it's not working out, or when you're done with it for that semester, you can dump the soil out, stack them up, and put them away. So sometimes it's kind of funny, you you know, that you're saying start small and then and then build up. Um, I almost feel like in certain situations you can get big faster by starting smaller sooner because of the fact that everybody is, I guess what I'm trying to say is you're basically setting yourself up for more success and you're giving yourself a goals that are achievable. And if those goals are clearly explained to your, uh, your administrators of the school, other teachers and other parents, that small success that one year could lead it to another classroom and maybe some bigger in-ground beds the next year. So sometimes it's a good idea to have a long game. Um, so I'm really glad you pointed that out about starting small. Because I think, you know, everybody says, oh, we want a school garden. We want a school garden. Well, if you look around and it's just you, the teacher, saying that, and another parent whose kid is in your class, and that's really all the momentum you have at that point, you know, I, put it out. Put it out in the hallway. Display it. Let everybody see it. But maybe don't start carrying the school-wide garden flag right out of the gate. Just a school garden-related project. 
um, is I think plenty. That can easily lead into something big later on. As long as it's not a big weeded mess. Because as the teacher and the parent of this one class, you get a grant and go build five beds somewhere, but really don't have the ability or the momentum to take care of that. Yeah, I think that's a good point. It's, it, it has to be, everything has to be sustainable too. You don't just build a garden and walk away. It's, it, it keeps on going. It, it grows weeds if you don't, if you don't show up to clean it up. And I also think too, that over time teachers get more and more comfortable with, with programs. Um, I know one teacher in particular would, would have the class do a certain project and it was great. And the next year he would do something, something different. And I, my, my guess is that he would just get more and more comfortable and build it into his actual curriculum going forward. So um, that's, that's another way for it to grow. I, I think that's a really important point is, um, you know, having that long plan, having that vision, we've discussed being willing and able to, so, so you have that plan and you move toward it, but also being able and willing to let go of it and go where kind of the garden leads. Um, but, but definitely having an exit strategy. What are you going to do if it doesn't work out? Um, so that you can make another run at it the, the next year. Um, Avon made another really good point that one of the things that you can use to kind of help gain momentum or get, uh, get people interested in the garden is a lot of people are seeking a sense of belonging. And as soon as Avon wrote that, it reminded me of what I think we saw at Gory and what I encourage school gardens to try and become. And that's almost like a little miniature community garden. And the community being the school. You know, like what, what makes up that school community? And getting as many facets of that community involved in that school garden project. Um, at Gory, it wasn't just the, just the we had the, we had the, um, we had the parents. We obviously had the teachers. We had the students. Um, did the did the after school groups that came in ever do anything with the garden? So unfortunately, we could not do anything with the after school clubs um, just due to some some regulations. But one thing we did do, which I thought was really cool, is we um, kind of we took the garden and we extended it to Girl Scouts, to Boy Scouts. Yep. Um, actually, actually, David. Not the after school program at Gory, not not that particular club, but other clubs like Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts. And um, there was even a patrol club that we let come out and they could spend a day with the garden. A certain, yeah, certain clubs and then the after school. It was a garden club that we had for for two sessions. It was it did fantastic. So they got to spend time in the garden. So it, it had extensions actually beyond the school into to kids that actually at other schools. So that's a really interesting point. So we got creative at kind of thinking about what makes up our school community. Um, and that's how we got the Girl Scouts involved. And you know, they, they worked on a bed. Did they, get, did they get some badges from working yeah. in the beds? That's, yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. And, and, and the kids that were in Girl Scouts, I, I think, also helped rally their own classrooms and got their teachers more involved with, with the school garden. So definitely by looking at your school more as a, uh, a dynamic community and trying to get as many different uh, uh, we also had staff involved. Um, I can't ever remember the gentleman's name but one Berrios. of the what's that? Mr. Barrios. Mr. Berrios? Berrios? Yeah. Yes. Um, Kristen Rowe, and then, Kristen Barkley. Yep. And then we also had um, custodial staff, right? Yep, absolutely. They were, they were excited about it, and they were keeping an eye on it. Um, and then the um, – I'm so sorry. I can't believe – I forgot. What was the principal's name? Sandler, Margie Sandler. Right. Um, and we, we kept her really engaged and excited and in, in, in the loop of what was going on. Um, I think the only times I ever ran into her was when I was checking in the office, but also when she would um, show up and come and um, I would see her. She, if people came to visit the school, she would bring them out and pray them, 
parade them around and and, and show them the garden. So the, the, the garden actually um, brought a lot of people to the school. They would come and they would visit many schools. And she actually said the garden sold a lot of people on the school. So I thought that was interesting. They, they liked that education. Parents did. And I think it's, I think it's really important. And, you know, I have a dream of trying to see a garden in every school. Um, yeah, I don't know exactly what that means. I just know that we need it. Um, because, I mean, you saw it. I saw it. I hope that every parent gets to experience uh, seeing a garden at their at their kid's school and, and the changes that are made um, in in the kids just I think they can get just so much out of it. It's not just about well, let's go through some of the stuff that you think the kids got out of it. Um, I think they learned, I mean, hey, listen, we're in a we're in a really urban environment. We have kids you've never seen gardens before. We had kids coming home with with like leaves and and um, tomatoes and and they would be on the school bus. I, I and I I would pick my daughter up daughter is plural at the bus stop and I'd see kids get off with produce. It was the coolest thing ever. Um, see them touch and um, watch it grow. Like let's say they grew something on the seedling tables, starting with a seed. They watched it grow from a from a tiny little seed and. Two, three weeks later, it was a seedling. They'd put it in the ground and they'd see it become a head of lettuce. Like that was really, really cool. And you saw, you also saw really interesting personalities come out. You saw some kids who were just fascinated by this, everything about the garden. And they became kind of like the school leaders in the garden. And that was really neat to see, see some kids to really, really gravitate to this. This was, this was their thing. Um, it was, it was, it was awesome. Um, I would say the majority of kids at Gory had never seen anything like this from seed to actual an actual fruit or whatever it is like a head of lettuce so that was i neat. think it helps i think it helps the kids get in touch to you know with kind of where their food comes from yep you know it doesn't just it doesn't just show up and, and, and come in from the grocery store yeah nutrition is a huge part of it too like understanding why this is so really really healthy and it, it, it didn't travel three thousand miles to get to the grocery store and it did you know this is it's, it's good for your food it, and you grew it you did this yourself yep and so i i don't think it was just the kids that really um got a lot out of it i also saw a lot saw a lot of changes um in parents um i know that uh, a few of the parents either up their game in gardening or started gardening at home, and I believe that you are one of them. <laughs> yes, I I did. I um fascinated by this. It was just an incredible journey and experience. And my I have one daughter who, in particular, is very into this, and she takes the whole gardening very very seriously. And she has a incredible butterfly garden in our backyard, and uh, lets so many of them go. She grows them all year long, and um. I still can't get anything to grow in the backyard. So this year I decided to, I was going to get a tower garden. It's kind of a aeropotic garden it takes up a little bit of space. Um, but it was, it was my love for gardening and my inability to grow anything in dirt. So I kind of, um, I found this thing that I've become very passionate about. It's, it's, it's called a tower garden. And I now have two of them and grow all of my produce at home. So it's, Super fun. Um, I love watching the kids get involved, and I go out there and I. Uh, what, what's uh, what's some of the stuff you've been eating from your homegrown veggies? So I we're huge lettuce people at our house. So I've got probably four or five different varieties of lettuce now, and um, we go through all of it. Um, ton of microgreens. We put those in our sandwiches and our smoothies on top yeah, those of burgers. Good. Yeah, and I'll eat them even as like a whole base of a salad. I'll just have. Microgreens oh, yeah. on the bottom, avocado, it's super good. Um, and then the eggplant are like growing out my ears. I don't know what to do with all the eggplants that are growing, but it's fascinating to see this small little device produce so much, so much fruit. And um, we've got squash, cucumbers, um, tomatoes. I'm watching those grow. I, I didn't have a like great luck with those last time, but um, all in all, it's been, it's been a really fun, a fun journey with it. Well, I think you started a little late, maybe. When did you get your tower garden and your tomatoes going? Um, a month ago. But no, I've been, I, the, my second tower garden is where I started the cucumbers and the tomatoes. I started those one month ago. Okay. Okay. So they just still haven't, 
they still haven't gotten going and produce it yet. No. Yeah. But I yeah. think the cucumbers will. But all in all, I feel I feel pretty good with what I've been able to grow, uh, given my black thumb and <laughs> dirt. Well, I, I don't think you have a black thumb anymore. <laughs> no, I mean, I've, learned, I've learned a lot. I mean, I can identify a caterpillar. I, I can identify like the the mildew on the on the leaves, and um, I know how to you know trim basil and how to how to harvest now. So I, I've definitely learned a lot, and I you, you have to know a little bit to to do well with it. But it's it's been fun. Well, I think the most important thing to tell people. You know, whether they're starting a garden at home or they are trying to get a school garden going or even maybe a small community garden or sharing a garden with neighbors, um, you know, start small, set reasonable expectations, um, have a long term plan. Don't be afraid to bob and weave. It's needed, actually. If you got those four things, the last is the most important. Don't be afraid to fail. <laughs> I'm not saying go into it to fail. You know, definitely poor planning. We don't want to fail because of poor planning. And we don't want to fail because we're biting off more than we can chew. But failure is part of the learning process. Um, and I'm sure you're figuring that out with your own home garden. I think that we had some, you know, near failures or things that weren't quite working out too well with what we were doing with the gory garden and we adjusted and we moved on but the main thing is is we weren't afraid of it. you know we weren't afraid to try something and go for it and then, and then kind of figure it out as, as we move forward so uh any any parting words for people who maybe are those were my parting words any parting words for people who maybe are trying to either start a garden at home or get a school garden going during this pandemic? I guess I would say, um, give it a shot. Like, give it a shot, but just make sure you, just make sure you do your homework. Do your homework. Have a really good understanding of the finances and have a really good understanding of, of what it takes to to keep it alive, like today and tomorrow. Because you may leave the school and you need to make sure. I actually left Gory last year, so I had to make sure that I could put. I, I kept track of all my paperwork and I had to, to give it to the next in line. Unfortunately, we had people who were super excited about taking on the garden. So I passed off all that paperwork. So you just make sure that um, you feel like it's something that's sustainable over time because the last thing you want is a garden that sits there and grows weeds because that's not going to help anyone. Um, yeah, the I, I guess out of this. on that note, um, I've told people that same thing before when we're talking about school gardens, it's kind of like, our goal here is that in two years, three years, or four years, if none of us are here, that this is still going. And what things do we need to do and put into place now so that that happens? Because we're talking about a garden, sometimes I get blank stares back when I say that. And like, I'll literally be talking to a PTSA, like I'll be in a PTSA meeting and I'm like, well, take for example, the fact that there's 10 different people sitting in this room right now that were sitting in here four years ago. But this meeting happens every single month on Monday at 8 a.m. How the heck does that happen? And then they kind of get it. Oh, my gosh, we know how to do this stuff. We do it already for other things that happen at the school. Um, a friend of mine called it, uh, like, you know, beer goggles. Uh, he called it garden goggles. That people like get when you're talking about the gardens like this, people get garden goggles and everything else that they know flies out the window. And you know, believe it or not, most people who get up and go to work every day or or throw a Christmas party every single year or remember people's birthdays or any of that stuff have the skill set to be successful at a school garden for sure. I, I completely agree with that. It just, it, again, it takes passion. You got to believe in it. You got to want it. And um, you just got to, you got to work to make it happen. But if, if and, and I think it's not that hard to sell. Um, it's, it's a, it's a, I think every school should have it. It was just, it, it was a really an incredible journey for me. And I, I loved that my kids were at the school and they got to see it come to life. And um, I will never forget Gory Grows. That was an, an, an awesome journey. Yeah, it was really cool, and but you definitely do not need to know how to grow a tomato. 
No, definitely not. That is not that is not a requirement. Well, thank you, Kristen. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, everybody, uh, we do this every single Wednesday at 5 30. I have a weekly nursery and garden report. I also um, every other week will cover a topic, and every other week I have a guest on my show. You can watch this either on Facebook, or I do a Facebook Live, or we're simulcasting on YouTube. So if in the next couple of weeks you need to get off Facebook, we're still doing this on YouTube. You can join us there. If you cannot join me live and you would like to uh, ask garden questions or suggest a topic, it's best to send it to our email at info, I-N-F-O, at Witwam organics.com. Thanks again, Kristen, for joining me. And everybody else, I will see you next week. Thanks, everybody. Bye.